Okay. Eric Demis. Present. Haskell Kennedy Jr. Haskell Kennedy Jr. I think. Oh, there you are. Uh, Sean Cronin. Yes, I'm here. Bruce Stebbins. Here. John Robertson. Here. Ron Hogan. Here. And Jennifer Von Figlio. Here. All right. Given the unprecedented circumstances resulting from the global coronavirus pandemic, Governor Charles Baker issued an order to provide limited relief from certain provisions of the open meeting law to protect the health and safety of individuals interested in attending public meetings. In keeping with the guidance provided, the commission will conduct a public meeting utilizing remote collaboration technology. Any votes will be taken by a roll call. This meeting is being recorded. And over to you, Commissioner. Great, thanks Tanya, and thanks everybody for your time and, uh, and your continued support and involvement with the commission. We greatly appreciate everybody's time and commitment to the workforce, uh, to the work of the subcommittee. Uh, we'll jump right into it. We'll move on to uh, item number two on the agenda, which is discussion of the 2021 Community Mitigation Fund Guidelines. And with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Delaney. Thanks, Bruce. Um, so just a uh, yeah, quick update on the guidelines. As of um, last Thursday, uh, the commission voted the guidelines. So we will, so our, our solicitation actually starts today. Uh, Mary was working all morning uh, to get all the documents up online and on uh, combis and so on. But just as part of the process, um, you know, we opened the guidelines up for public comment. We did receive one set of comments from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Um, you know, we reviewed those and, and they were mostly uh, dealing with, with issues uh, regarding the workforce uh, uh, grants that we do. And actually in looking at the, the comments, we really allow, they, they were asking for a few things um, to be allowed under the guidelines, which we really already do. So we, so we just tweak the guidelines just a, a little bit just to make it clear that those items were eligible. Um, and so we made that minor change, brought it to the commission, and they voted them, uh, as I said, last uh, Thursday. So the next steps going forward on this, as you may remember from our discussions earlier on the guidelines, is we have a number of communities that still have um, the reserves out. Um, that were given out back in 2015 and 2016. And um, the guidelines gave all of those communities until the end of 2021, calendar year 2021, to get those funds committed. So um, actually in the next uh, day or two, uh, hopefully before Thanksgiving, we're gonna get a letter out to all of those communities um, notifying them of that but also to um, set up a workshop with those folks on December 15th to talk about what are some of the ways that they can use that money and, and, and um, you know, try to get people to start thinking about it. And, and obviously if people can't make that meeting, we would be happy to meet with them separately uh, to discuss some of these things as well. Um, and then otherwise in uh, the first week of January, we are scheduling two more, uh, Sort of public workshops on this one for the workforce development grants what we really want those folks to do um, you know Jill Griffin um, is working on uh, coming up with a list of folks to invite to that I mean we have all the people that have uh, gotten grants from us before uh, that we're going to go out to uh, but there is there are some other groups that are out there that might want to avail themselves of grants and maybe want to partner with um, some of the other um, groups that uh, that have come in before. So there's that one and then we're going to have sort of a general uh, uh, workshop for all of the other grant applications. Most of the other applications are pretty similar in nature. We're asking for the same types of information even though they you know they go between you know some transportation, some specific impact. They all deal with the same uh, kinds of things and again we, we want to just you know sort of stress to folks what they need to do 
to do a good application and um, give them some things to think about when they are pulling together their applications. You know, I think as we said, we last year we had some difficulty with some of the applications being um, a little bit uh, less fulsome than they might have otherwise been. Um, and then also uh, one of the things that we talked about before is that we that um, with the sheriff's office in Hamden County, uh, you know, we have been giving them uh, money each year for uh, lease assistance at the Western Mass Alcohol Correction Center. Um, the commission decided, as as was recommended by our our local uh, community mitigation advisory committees and this subcommittee, not to sort of earmark money for the sheriff's office, but to make them certainly eligible, certainly eligible to apply. For a grant, but we would simply treat them as we do any other applicant. Um, so the other thing that I, I do want to do is um, get a letter out to them uh, just to let them know of that decision, just so they're not sort of blindsided by it um, at all, just to be fully upfront with them that, you know, that, look, they're certainly eligible, they can certainly come in, um, but we're not going to sort of give them special treatment. Um, so with that, I think that's it. Bruce, did I miss anything on that? Uh, I don't think so. We open it up for any any questions. Obviously, everybody's seen the guidelines. You're all familiar with them, as as Joe pointed out. There, uh, uh, we we had a uh, set of comments from MAPC and felt that those were adequately adequately addressed in the guidelines. But uh, any questions for Joe about the best practices sessions or the uh, or the final approved guidelines or the timetable? Just to uh, just to reiterate uh, Joe's point, and the commission talked about this the other day, is that you know, these best practices sessions we really hope uh, will give every community uh, applying for a, a grant uh, a, a better chance of success uh, in really helping them be clear and understanding what the commission is looking for when we review applications. And again, we want don't want communities to spin their wheels, but we want them to be able to come in with a, a good solid application if, uh, if they feel there is, uh, uh, is an impact or a positive planning grant that they should be applying for. Any other questions? If not, we can move on to the next item on the agenda. Okay. Um, as a, I believe as a result of our last meeting, uh, many of you, we're curious or interested in what the impact of the COVID operating guidelines have had on our licensees. Um, we're very happy to have uh, Jackie Crum, who represents Encore Boston Harbor, join us today uh, and to give an impact or an update as to uh, how COVID and some of the guidelines that, uh, that they've worked very well with the commission to uh, Institute have had on the business, but uh, with that, I thought I saw Jackie up there. She's here with us. Uh, I'd like to introduce Jackie Crum from Encore Boston Harbor. Thank you, Commissioner Stebbins. How are you? So, mm -hmm. I apologize as this may be a little bit duplicative. I think you heard sort of the same speech last week, but uh, for the benefit of the committee, uh, I apologize to you and I'll go through the, uh, the spiel again. So uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, I should say, and thank you for having us here. Um, since we last met, uh, a couple of updates. As you all know, we uh, temporarily ceased operations on March 15th of 2020 and reopened to uh, the general public on July 12th. Uh, as you can imagine, this was a pretty difficult process for us because we have a building that was designed to be open 24 hours uh, a day, seven days a week. Uh, in fact, uh, most of our exterior doors do not even have locks. So we had to uh, figure out how to keep it closed and safe during that period. We had a very limited uh, number of staff members on during that period, mostly facilities and security, just to make sure that the asset was protected during the closure. Uh, following reopening, uh, we had a very successful reopening. Uh, we were essentially following three uh, lines of guidance. One was the initial phase three opening of gaming establishments. That was the minimum requirements for reopening that the uh, uh, Gaming Commission adopted. 
Uh, the second is we also had to follow all the sector specific reopening requirements that the uh, Commonwealth uh, promulgated. So that pertained to, for instance, a restaurants, hotel, fitness center, office space, retail facilities, private gatherings, and uh, close contact personal services, such as the spa. So we, we fell into um, category, uh, sorry, phase three of that reopening, uh, even though some of our other amenities uh, fell into earlier phases. And then the third thing was we, uh, we adopted and developed our own health and san sanitation program, which was submitted to the MGC for approval. And this was a very detailed plan uh, of all the measures that we put in place to keep our guests, employees, and the community at large safe. Uh, we developed it in consultation with uh, public health medical pro uh, professionals and fellows of Georgetown and Johns Hopkins universities. Um, so those were the three things that we did. And as I said, we had a very successful opening, reopening uh, in July. As you all know, uh, earlier this month, the governor uh, instituted a further order that uh, restricts businesses, certain businesses from operating from 10 p.m. until 5 a.m. Uh, as a result of that, we have changed our um, operating times from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. for the casino. Uh, we were not able to continue to operate the hotel at the current time under these restrictions. So we did have to close the hotel and we've also curtailed the uh, restaurant offerings. Uh, that's had a significant impact on our uh, employee base. Uh, it's Im impacted approximately another 1,000 employees. So, um, you know, we, we're, we're adapting. We're continuing to do what's required of us. Um, our employees have been incredibly adaptable. The Gaming Commission has been incredibly helpful to us in terms of instituting these new procedures. Um, I think the main challenges we're having is... Uh, particularly at the beginning, uh, enforcing mask wearing. And I think the guidance has changed on that since we reopened. So I think it's much more prevalent now that everybody knows that they have to wear a mask. When we first opened, that wasn't necessarily the case. And so we uh, had ambassadors who went around and constantly told people to pick up their masks. Um, the social distancing, we're getting better at it, better at it with practice. Um, our main issue is that we have only elevators, no stairwells that lead from the casino, from the hotel and casino into the garage. So everybody needs to enter and exit unless you're coming in through the front doors through the elevator banks. Um, we were, we, that was a challenge. We, uh, finally, we finally got the hang of that. And now with the new restriction of having to clear out the building by you know, 9 p.m. every night, uh, what we've done is we've opened the emergency exits on the stairwells so that we can get people out and into the garage uh, in a quick, very quickly. The final challenge I think was uh, the commission wanted to make sure that if anyone was drinking uh, on the casino floor, that they were seated at all times. Uh, we have plexiglass between a lot of the uh, slot machines and between on every single table, every position is surrounded by plexigla plexiglass. So uh, that was definitely an education uh, portion for our guests to understand. You know, they were used to sitting down at one machine, having a cocktail, being able to pick it up and move it to another machine. So um, I think, uh, again, we, uh, it took a while, but we finally got people to understand that they needed to remain seated and finish their beverage before they uh, moved to another machine. So I think that brings us up to date. Um, I'm certainly available for any questions you may have. Open it up to anybody who has questions for, for Jackie about operations obviously we're just talking about encore boston harbor uh but jackie was kind enough to come on and kind of share an update as to what's going on at the property jackie i have a question um obviously you guys operate between here and nevada um but are you following what other jurisdictions are doing with respect to gaming operations and how massachusetts might differ in some of those respects uh, yeah, we, we're keeping, uh, we're, we're looking at that. I mean, it, it's no secret that our competitors in Connecticut do not have the same restrictions. And we are seeing uh, that some of our customers, because of the 9 p.m. closing time, are going back to uh, Mohegan Sun or Foxwood. So we're following their regulations quite closely. We're also watching what they're doing in New York. Uh, as you may be aware, New York implemented a very similar sort of, we won't call it a curfew, but a stay at home between 10 a.m. and 5 a.m. 
uh, they've interpreted it a little bit differently in New York. Um, they've said that gaming can continue up until that 10 p.m. mark and then shut down. So we're looking at things constantly um, in the different jurisdictions. You know, I, I, look, we're very pleased to be able to stay open. We realize this is a trying time for everybody. We're working very closely with the city of Everett, so we know their numbers are climbing. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to be a good community partner as well as uh, maintain the business and obviously um, the jobs for our employees. Okay. Thanks. Is there anybody else on the line that has any questions for, for Jackie about operations at Encore Boston Harbor? Hearing none, Jackie, thank you as always for your time. Greatly appreciate it. Of course, and, thank you for um, having me. Wish you and the team at Encore Boston Harbor a happy and healthy thank, uh, Thanksgiving. To you too, all of you. Bye-bye. Uh, we'll quickly move on to item number four. Uh, a number of you had, uh, you've been great about expressing interest in uh, the different facets and operations of the Gaming Commission. Uh, one of those uh, which uh, should des deserves attention is the great work that our team does regulating horse racing uh, in Massachusetts. So we wanted to bring on our director of racing, Dr. Alex Lightbound, uh, as well as uh, her colleague, Chad Bork. Uh, Chad tracks all of the financial reportings that come through horse racing. Alex is obviously the point person when it comes to making sure that uh, uh, Plain Ridge Park, as well as our other simulcasting locations, uh, continue to follow the regulations. Uh, obviously, this has been a, a unique year, uh, but I know Alex is joining us, and I'd invite her to give us an update on horse racing. The season is winding down this week. Um, and then we'll invite Chad to talk a little bit uh, and share a chart, I believe, that shows how the money flows, uh, not only to the state, but back to local host communities. So, uh, Alex, if I can introduce you, I saw you on the screen, so welcome, and uh, thanks for your time. I know you're, you're probably down at the track today. I am. Thank you, Commissioner, uh, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, yeah, today um, we're down at uh, Plain Ridge. They uh, have live racing um, until Friday, and then the season's over. Um, their season was delayed with the opening. We were uh, just starting to get our season um, up and running when the COVID hit. As a matter of fact, we had a bunch of um, restarting items on the commission agenda, and um, the agenda got um, stopped halfway through the day due to COVID. Um, but we were very happy that we were able to open um, later in the uh, summer and get a, a good meet off and um, get the purse money out to the horsemen. And, um, you know, that money, it doesn't just go to folks at the racetrack, but it trickles down across the state to um, people that run tax stores, um, the farriers, the people who grow hay, um, and all different, uh, you know, veterinarians. So the money gets spread out, not just at the racetrack, but all over the state. So we're very happy that we were able to get a, a good meet in. Um, right, right now in Massachusetts, there's only live racing at Plain Ridge. And uh, on a normal um, year, they do 110 days of live racing. Um, they also have simulcasting and account wagering. And um, Suffolk Downs and Raynham have just simulcasting and account wagering at this point. Um, simulcasting is, um, takes place at the racetracks and allows people to place bets on races that are out of state. So you could go to Plain Ridge and place a bet on a race in Kentucky, something like that. Um, account wagering is also legal in Massachusetts and has been for quite a while. Um, it's basically online um, betting. You can bet from your phone, um, your laptop, and um, this actually was um, a very fortunate thing for racing this year. Um, <clears throat> during the shutdown, the account wagering was able to still continue because that did not involve any person in person contact. So people could you know, sit at their home and um, continue to bet. And um, later on, Chad can give you some figures on um, how, especially with the shutdown of all, almost all other types of uh, gaming, 
um, we really did benefit from that. And that money um, goes to pay the Gaming Commission's racing division expenses. And it also goes into purse accounts and obviously to the tracks to help pay for um, their employees. So we were fortunate um, in the face of COVID to still have that kind of a stream of money coming in. Um, <clears throat> The Division of Racing has just uh, three full-time um, positions right now. Um, myself, the Director of Racing, and I'm also the Chief Veterinarian. Uh, we have uh, Chad Bork, who's our Senior Financial Analyst, and he's in charge of reconciling all the different numbers that come in and um, making sure that billings go out and that type of thing. And we also have a full-time licensing coordinator. Um, for licensing, we usually license uh, uh, around a thousand people um, each year um, at uh, Plain Ridge and when Suffolk was racing, we would do the same there. Um, <clears throat> there's about 15 different categories of licensees um, from grooms to trainers, owners, racing officials, and uh, paramutual clerks, security. So as you can see, there's a lot of different types of jobs at the racetracks themselves. There's almost a position for anyone who want, is interested in racing. Um, the uh, Division of Racing has several different um, sections of, the, of employees. We have judges. So um, every race um, is observed by our judges. Um, if somebody, if a driver cuts off another driver or there's a photo finish or anything like that, they make um, during racing decisions. Um, they're also in charge of um, holding hearings if there's a drug positive or anything along those lines. Um, we have a good veterinary staff. Uh, we test um, the winner of every race and at least one other horse um, post-race. And then we also do pre-race testing. Um, again, we have um, licensing personnel, and basically anybody who has contact with the horses or with the money um, needs a license from us. So, um, <clears throat> and that uh, gives us the ability to um, control who has access to the money and to the animals for regulatory purposes. Uh, let's see, our, we have a test barn coordinator who is in charge of keeping all the paperwork for our drug testing. Um, and then we have uh, veterinary assistants who um, take the samples, the urine samples from the horses, and they assist the veterinarians with the blood draws. Um, and they also um, observe the administration of Lasix, which is the only uh, medication a drug a horse can receive on race day. So um, we have a, a nice staff. Um, these people are seasonal, and um, for the most part, they come back year to year. They really enjoy the um, racing. Um, we also have um, several state police that um, are primarily assigned to racing. And again, um, several of them have been with us for a number of years, so they get to know um, the business and, and all, and are helpful on any investigations that we have. Uh, let's see. Um, we're, we have a lot of um, regulations and protocols. Um, we're very heavy on that as a good way to regulate the industry. Um, I mentioned the judges before. If um, a trainer gets a um, judgment against them th that the judges rule, um, if they want to appeal that, they can, and they appeal it to the um, hearing officer. Um, if once the hearing officer has ruled, if the um, person wants to appeal their uh, ruling, they can appeal that to the gaming commission. And then um, once the gaming commission has ruled, if they aren't satisfied with that, they could go to the courts. So there's um, a very extensive appeal process um, there to protect everybody's rights. Um, and it also, um, there's a lot of protocols that go along with that. Um, as was mentioned earlier about um, COVID, um, that was um, uh, a challenge for us this year. Um, we had to come up with protocols, uh, not only for the live racing, but also for the simulcast facilities. So we ended up with um, several different um, protocols that um, we worked with um, uh, with the 
horsemen with the different um, tracks to come up with protocols that we thought would uh, work. Um, we were fortunate with um, Plain Ridge because their uh, director of racing covers many different racetracks across the country. So um, they had already been working on some protocols in other states so um, and had an idea on what was working and what wasn't. Um, the interesting thing with the um, COVID with the six feet in distancing on live horse racing, that works out, um, it's almost inherent that you have to do it because if you um, have a horse, you don't wanna be closer than six feet necessarily to the person handling them and risk getting kicked or whatever. So um, some of the protocols, we actually kind of used the horse as a um, plexiglass shield instead of the shield we could use the horse. So for instance, one of the um, protocols was when the vet's drawing the blood on one side of the horse, the handler stands on the other side. So um, we were able to um, take some of these protocols that everybody may be very familiar with in general and tweak them so it would work um, with the horses. Um, one thing was um, pens, um, and this, this kind of sounds, they sound, um, a little silly to people, but we asked the trainers to each bring their own pens. Um, we have three or four different protocols for different things where um, the trainers have to sign off on like the evidence cards, um, on the sample cards, when their horses are treated with the Lasix. And we figured that between the different programs that we have each day, we would have been um, disinfecting over a hundred pens. And we just thought, you know, it'd be safer if we didn't have to worry about that. Um, I'm sure you, you all have been places where they have one cup with clean pens and one cup for, to put people's used pens in. Um, we just asked everybody to bring their own pen. <laughs> um, we also did get um, numerous inexpensive pens. So if somebody forgot to bring a pen, we just gave them one and they could use that. Um, Again, most of the, um, with the simulcasting, most of those protocols were very similar to what might have been done at the um, gaming establishments at the casinos. Um, things about moving tables further apart, um, making sure people weren't walking around with their drinks, with their masks down and that type of thing. Uh, one thing that um, the commission was able to do, um, Plain Ridge asked to use these walkabout devices. Um, and it's basically a, mobile apparatus where you can um, move it around and people can place their bets through that with a um, parimutuel clerk. So you still place it with a live person, um, but you don't have to actually go into the building. And so their idea for um, one of the big race days when they expected a lot of um, traffic was to have these set up in the parking lot, one of the parking lots that wasn't um, being used and people could drive through and do drive through betting. So um, we did a, a lot of um, research into that and presented it to the commission and the commissioners approved the use um, for that day. And it was uh, uh, successful. Um, instead of um, a lot of people trying to get in and get out to place their bets, um, people uh, were able to sit in their cars and drive through and get their bets in that way. And um, it limited the number of people who wanted to actually get into the building and it, um, they were able to get their bets in. Um, and again, that's just um, recognizing the clientele and realizing that there are gonna be people who wanna come in and be there for the entire day. Um, so those people were able to be accommodated. Um, obviously they had, um, uh, re reductions on the number of people who could be in the building, but those people could come in and the um, facility didn't have to worry about um, other people who just wanted to come in, place a bet, and then leave and maybe go home and watch the um, race at home on the TV. So again, that was kind of thinking outside the box and coming up with a solution that worked for everybody. Um, where we do a lot of um, different steps to be sure we're um, taking care of the horses. There's three different um, basically kinds of veterinarians. We have a track veterinarian that's employed by Plain Ridge that observes all the horses on race day to make sure they're fit and sound to race. 
Um, and then we have our um, commission vets who are doing the drug testing and then the ones that are doing the um, blood gas testing. We um, follow um, what's called the Association of Racing Commissioners International. It's a international group of uh, all the commissions um, and they come up with model rules and suggested regulations. And um, one of the things is having a accredited laboratory. So um, when we came over to the Gaming Commission, um, we started contracting out our lab work. Um, they have to be what's called RMTC uh, certified, which is the Racing Medication and Testing Consortium. So they have their own certification process, as well as study, uh, uh, be in compliance with the International Organization of Standardization. So um, there's a, a definite, um, that's been an upgrade to our process as far as having a, a laboratory with um, all these different certifications. Uh, let's see, the, um, on the thoroughbred end of it right now, um, obviously Suffolk isn't racing anymore. There are a couple of groups that are um, kind of exploring, um, trying to open a new track. One of them is out in Sturbridge and another one's in Wareham. And um, as you can imagine, any um, big project, there's a lot of different steps involved, um, but um, we are happy that, that places are, people and horsemen are still looking at the possibility of maybe getting thoroughbred racing up and going again. Um, you know, one of the big benefits to horse racing off the track is the farms that are out in Massachusetts. Um, I know where I live, there's um, a thoroughbred farm um, 10 minutes in, to the east of me, and there's a harness track 10 minutes to the west of me. So um, these farms are definitely out there and, um, you know, keeping the open space is important. Uh, <clears throat> I'll talk just a, briefly, um, on the standard bread side, there, there's been a big increase in the number of um, horses that are being bred, which has been um, a very encouraging program. Um, they've tripled the number of foals born each year. They have probably around 45 different farms around the state that um, are breeding horses. And um, if you look at the map that they have, it's, it's all over. It's, it's north, it's south, it's east, it's west. So um, a numerous uh, communities um, within the state are um, affected by this, which is great. Um, um, Commissioner Stebbins, is there anything else you think I should add? No. I... Stebbins is very um, familiar with the racing and, and um, often comes down to um, to the tracks to see what's going on. And um, when we have people in to meet with us on the different proposals, he's um, almost always one of the commissioners that's involved first with us. Well, thanks, Alex. Uh, no, I think you you gave a, a great overview to the great work that you and your team do. Uh, I would I would pause and, and give uh, the folks at uh, Plain Ridge Park uh, uh, tip of the cap this year. I think they've made a, a strong effort to write as many race cards as possible to benefit Massachusetts uh, based uh, owners and trainers and, and drivers, uh, really trying to keep that money, as, as Alex said, uh, from the Racehorse Development Fund, try to keep it local. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing that we're always challenged by is the fact that the old racing and simulcasting statutes uh, which were really written and formulated for a, a, an era that's kind of bygone, uh, really have needed some updating and continue to sunset. And we get an extension of the sunset. Um, right now, I think those statutes have been sun, uh, extended through July 31st of next year. Um, you know, there really are some changes, which Alex you know, said we have a lot of interest in uh, reinvigorating and restarting a thoroughbred track and some of the updates that need to be made to those statutes uh, could really benefit uh, somebody looking to bring thoroughbred racing back to the Commonwealth. So we continue to work with our uh, partners in the legislature, try to offer them uh, 
some legislative proposals that would allow uh, racing to continue to be competitive and make the best use out of um, simulcasting and also out of the use of the racehorse development fund monies. Um, I'll open it up though, uh, if anybody has any questions uh, for Alex about racing, um, be happy to entertain those at this point if anybody had any questions. Alex, this is this is Joe. I just I had a question for you on some of these proposals for thoroughbred tracks. Do you think that these have any real chance of moving forward absent them getting some kind of other gaming along with it? I know that Wareham project proposes, you know, slots with it. I don't think the Sturbridge one is really, I think they were proposing a sports book with it. But do you think abs, you know, as a standalone thoroughbred track, that, that there's really good, any good chance that that, that could succeed? I know the um, Sturbridge proposal has said that if they didn't get any um, added um, sports book or things like that, they would still be interested in going forward. Um, they did say that if um, other places are getting it, um, that they might be at a disadvantage not having it. Um, so, you know, that, that was how they were looking at it, was that um, it might be at a disadvantage. Um, with the Racehorse Development Fund um, purse money, there is an advantage in that um, they don't have to be as concerned about um, generating the money for purses from the handle because they can get um, an input from the Racehorse Development Fund. And clearly, um, the most of these proposals, well, if they're looking for sports betting or like the Wareham project, if they're actually going to um, try to be a slots parlor, um, that would obviously take um, legislation. So that's probably the first hurdle is um, trying to get any legislation done. All right, thanks. Anybody else for questions for Alex? If you were looking for seasonal employment, wanting to learn how to be a judge, she can certainly take your calls at another time. But uh, <laughs> um, just kudos to, uh, to, to Alex and her team, especially down in Plain Ridge. Um, like everywhere else, it's been a trying year and trying to uh, make sure that the horsemen, the, the day shippings for racing, we're doing it in a safe fashion. Uh, I know Alex, like uh, we heard the team over at Encore Boston Harbor had to walk around doing a lot of reminding of people to pull their mask up. Um, so, uh, but we also had great, great cooperation from the Harness Horsemen's Association as well as uh, the team at, uh, at Plain Ridge Park. Uh, if there are no questions for Alex, uh, Alex, I'll invite you to go ahead and introduce uh, uh, the incredible Chad Bork from uh, your team. <laughs> So uh, Chad is our uh, senior financial analyst. And um, as you can imagine, with all of these um, betting dollars coming in and uh, going out again for different um, uh, functions, uh, it all has to be kept track of. So that is uh, Chad's main uh, <laughs> job, among other things, is keeping track of where all the, all the money that's coming in and all the money that's going out and uh, reconciling it and making sure um, that the different payments that these um, monies are going to, um, that, that it does go through. So now I'll introduce Chad. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Bruce. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Alex stated, I'm the financial analyst in the racing division. And um, I guess to dumb it down a little bit, um, uh, basically, I would say my main function is to gather uh, all the racing activity that happens um, throughout the month on a quarter annual basis and we use that um, you know for monthly billings um, any ad hoc or annual quarterly uh, financial reporting and then also um, to tabulate and distribute uh, funds out of some of the trust funds um, one of the responsibilities that uh, I also do is for local aid and uh, what local aid is is uh, basically where funds take uh, where racing activities take place uh, there is some aid uh, to that to that town where um, 
where the licensees are. So uh, we thought it'd be a good idea to kind of go over that a little bit and show you, um, you know, how the process works and how the money flows. And then um, I'll just say a quick note about um, how, you know, the COVID restrictions or guidelines have uh, had an effect on, on uh, our department this year, racing overall. So I am going to attempt to share my screen. And let's do... Okay. Can you see that? We can. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so let me let me start here. Okay. Um, so I created. I'll just show you real quick. So this one will just go over basically all the um, uh, the actual process, and then the second page I've provided an example of a quarterly local aid calculation, and then lastly. Um, We'll use this to go over um, the activity this year versus last year. Um, so the way that that local aid works, um, again, it's payable to each city and town where racing is conducted. Um, so we have Plain Ridge Park Casino, um, and the town for them is Plainville. Uh, we also have uh, Suffolk Downs, um, which uh, is no longer conducting live racing, as you know, and uh, but they do still have a, a, a pretty healthy simulcast and a, um, account deposit wagering um, footprint um, along with Wonderland and Random Park. Uh, so what I do is um, on a quarterly basis, what I'll do is I will take um, all the live simulcasts and export handles. And handles are basically just another term for all the wagers that um, were done. And it's based on racing activity during the quarter, so the three months, but it's a look back six months prior. Um, and again, all these wagers are, are, are placed either at the track, um, they're done for live racing, um, they can be done for, you know, the Breeders' Cup, um, uh, there's races in Australia, Japan, so it's really an, an international um, uh, system here, and um, the ADWs allow for uh, you know, patrons in the United States to go ahead and, and wager on that. Um, so once all the activity is calculated, um, what we do is we then multiply all that by 0 0.0035. And then um, each of those will have um, their payout amount. Um, so obviously Plain Ridge Park uh, goes to the town of Plainville. Um, Suffolk Downs and Wonderland do a split. So two thirds of that calculation uh, goes to the city of Boston and the other third goes to Revere. And then Random Park goes to the, uh, the town of Random. So here's a little um, snapshot of um, a, an actual um, local aid payout um, from March 31st of this year. Uh, so if we look over on the, the, the left hand, the Excel spreadsheet, as you'll see, um, we tally up all the wagers um, that are done um, with our licensees for those three months, and then we total them up, and um, we, we do the multiplication and then um, pay out. So if we look at Plain Ridge Park, so, so for that period, um, at the track, um, there was a, you know, they wagered um, close to seven and a half million in handle. And then they also have um, their own account, deposit wagering account and uh, that accounted for 1.1 million. And then exports, uh, which is basically other people in other jurisdictions uh, wagering on the actual races that Plain Ridge, is, um, Plain Ridge is actually putting on. So that was actually a pretty good good month for them. So 
um, outside of um, Plain Ridge um, Park Casino, 6.6 .6 million was wagered. So once you tally all that up, uh, the, uh, the final number was um, a little north of 15 million and you do your multiplication and the local aid comes out to, to that number, the 53,114 spot 58. And then what I'll do is I'll package all this together with the backup, um, bring it in front of um, Bruce and, and, and uh, the other commissioners and it goes up for vote. Uh, they, they look at it and you know, make sure all my calculations are, are correct and all the guidelines are being followed. And then um, they, if, if they do approve, um, which I haven't yet, so that's uh, where they haven't approved, so that's a good thing. Uh, we'll go ahead and then disperse the funds out to, um, out to Plainville. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll quickly stop there and see if there's any questions on this or if you want to go over another one or. Um, yeah, um, thanks, Chad. And I know a number of few people are dialing in by phone so we will uh, send you a copy of uh, Chad's presentation it's tremendously well done it is very self-explanatory um, but obviously uh, if you do have any questions about uh, the process uh, feel free to reach out to Chad uh, and or Alex and uh, I know they'd be happy to answer any questions you might have after seeing the charts um, Chad, you want to just cover that that last slide, which obviously is indicative of some of the impacts that uh, the closures in COVID nineteen have had on uh, on revenue. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, this year, obviously, with the the, the restrictions and, and the guidelines, um, you know, we were thinking that um, everyone was, you know. Um, going to take a, a big hit, um, which um, has has happened. Um, one of the things that um, is is has held up for racing is um, the fact that um, wagering still um, could take place through um, the ADWs or account deposit wagering. So that is very similar to um, where you just you would log on, you would sign up for an account, and then you're able to wager on tracks internationally. Um, and so um, the, the racing people are, um, they, they do like to wager. So there was definitely um, going to be, um, you know, a way that they found um, to be able to wager. Um, so some of, the, some of the statistics here kind of, you know, show that. Um, so if we, if we look at, um, the actual, uh, at the tracks themselves, um, you'll see the negative numbers here, um, are all because the tracks were closed for such a long time. Um, so you'll see Plain Ridge, their handle was actually down almost 60%, Raynham almost 40, Suffolk almost 60, and Wonderland over 60. So the actual at track wagering um, was down significantly. Um, that said, um, what you probably saw is that many of these patrons, again, stating that they you know, like to um, have a little skin in the game when watching um, the races, probably migrated over and opened up accounts through these um, ADWs, which are these right here. So, Plain Ridge has um, their own ADW, and there was a slight uptick in that. I think part of that too is that um, much of the wagering at, at Plain Ridge comes from the live racing, so that's why there was kind of not as um, a bigger uptick there. Um, however, when you look at um, the TVGs, the Twin Spires, the Express Vets, and the Nairas, all those ADW providers, you'll see were significantly up. So when you compare the totals from last year over this year, our handle is actually almost up 25%. Um, so I, I think, you know, if, 
if anything kind of good has come into this in terms of there has been kind of a, an uptick or increase in, in interest in, um, in, in, the, in racing itself um, and um, the, the ease that, that someone could get into the racing. And that just always is gonna flow down to the, you know, the local communities, the trust funds, um, the horsemen, and um, so it's it's um, it is if anything again it's it's shown a good light and um, you know we seeing the increase has been has been helpful and um, any questions with that or uh, I'm done with my presentation if uh, if if there isn't great thanks Chad sure. any questions from anyone. Like I said, I know some of you are dialing in by phone. We'll make sure that uh, we get these slides out to you so you can watch the flow of money when it comes to uh, betting on horse racing in the Commonwealth and what it means to the, the host communities for each of these track, for the track or simulcast location. Um, Bruce, I had, I had one question for um, Alex. <clears throat> on, you, you touched on it a little bit on the Racehorse Development Fund. Do you think you could elaborate on that just a little bit about, you know, sort of where the money comes from and how much that is and how it gets distributed? Sure. Um, that was set up by the um, Expanded Gaming Act. Um, and <clears throat> basically it takes 9% um, uh, of the gross gaming revenue from the Category 2 casino, which happens to be Plain Ridge. Um, and that money goes to the Racehorse Development Fund. And then um, on the two category one casinos by statute, 25% um, is taken off of the gross gaming revenue. And of that 25%, 2.5% goes into the um, racehorse development fund. Um, so then that money is split into um, basically six different um, pots, if you will. 80% um, is to go to purses. So that goes into um, a purse account for standard breads and a purse account for thoroughbreds. Um, then 16% um, goes towards the breeders of each breed. And then 4% um, goes into um, a health and pension plan for the horsemen of each breed. And um, for a long time, the, um, what happened was the split was decided first on between the two breeds. So um, originally, um, the split was 75% towards thoroughbreds and then 25% towards standard breads. And then you took from that amount of money, you took the 80, the 16 and the four. Um, that was back when um, at that time, Suffolk was racing a full schedule. And um, the statute also set up what they call the horse racing committee. And it designates um, who's on there, somebody, um, a governor's appointee, um, an appointee by the treasurer, um, a breed representative from each of the two breeds, and then a representative of the, of the commission who happens to be um, Gail Cameron, one of our commissioners. So that committee meets, um, they try to meet once a year, sometimes due to um, not having a full quorum and stuff, they've had to postpone it. Um, but they try to meet once a year and see if there's been anything that's changed in the industry that might um, lead them to change the percentages. So over the years, I think it's been changed maybe three or four times. And the primary um, change has been due to Suffolk not having a full schedule of racing. So the percentage has um, increased each time towards the standard breads, um, having more money going into um, their different percentages. Um, in talking to the state ho stakeholders, um, they um, wondered if there was a way, instead of dividing the three, um, categories of purses, um, breeding money, and um, health and pension benefits, instead of having that have to be the same for um, each category for the breed, they wondered if a certain breed would benefit more from having increased purses and another breed would maybe benefit more from having increased health and um, pension benefits, was there a way that that could be done? So um, we our legal, um, Council looked at that and felt that the statute um, didn't prevent that. Um, and so the commission, it was brought to the commission and the commission um, voted to change 
the regulations um, so that it could be done um, by each individual pot, basically, instead of um, the whole row having to be <clears throat> done one way or the other. So this last time this year, um, when the horse racing committee met, they decided to um, split the purse money and the breeding money 70-30 um, to the standard breads, but they decided on the health and welfare benefits to um, give 60% of that money to the thoroughbred people and 40 to the standard bread um, people for their um, health and pension benefits. And um, that was a really, um, the horse racing committee met, you know, numerous times. Um, they had a hearing, open hearing where all the stakeholders could speak. Uh, and again, this is all done over, you know, these Zoom type um, meetings. So it was quite an accomplishment. I think. <laughs> committee to get all that done and hear from all the different stakeholders. Um, and that was, you know, what they ended up doing. Um, right now for uh, the last, since uh, 15, 2015, um, Suffolk has not um, raced enough days to use up the money that would have gone to thoroughbred purses. And so um, that money uh, each year is just given out for the purses that they're actually going to use. So there is money, and I think it's, um, you know, this isn't news to anybody. It's been out in the news and all, um, and all the figures are on our website. There is um, probably about 17 million in that account that um, would have been directed towards thoroughbred purses, but um, hasn't been given out. Um, and um, the rest of the money, goes out on a regular basis. So um, when the money comes in, our um, financial team divides all that money and, and um, the <clears throat> funds go to all different places. So, you know, there's other um, categories that um, get money from that, from the casino. So that all gets split up and then they split it up on the resource development fund into the six different categories. And um, right now where um, Suffolk isn't racing, that money stays in the um, pot. But the other five categories, that money goes right out to um, Plainridge for the purses. It goes out to the two um, breeding organizations for their um, programs. And then again, to the two different um, breed organizations for their um, horsemen. Great, thanks. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Chad. Appreciate your time and, and uh, sharing some background on, on racing in Massachusetts. Um, it is still impressive to see the numbers uh, financially of people that are still betting on races if they aren't physically happening in Massachusetts, but um, uh, at other tracks around the country. And the fact that that has turned almost a positive revenue uh, number around for the commonwealth in this in this tough year um we'll move on to the unless there are any other questions any questions for alex or chad again thanks alex and chad for spending some time with the subcommittee today and giving us an overview of horse racing in massachusetts and the, uh, well, and the thank financial you. impact that it has uh joe we'll move on to item number five which is next steps um What's on the table for that? Well, so I guess today's meeting really sort of concludes um, the activities of this subcommittee for this year. Um, as I said, the um, guidelines are finalized on Thursday. The solicitation for projects for the Community Mitigation Fund um, hits the street today. Um, so, and we've got those three workshops coming up, one December 15th, and I'm not sure we have the final dates in early January slated yet for the other two, but uh, that will be coming. Um, applications for the Community Mitigation Fund are due January 31st. Um, so those are sort of the next steps in the process. And I think, so with our local community mitigation advisory uh, committees, um, we've talked about having maybe a follow-up meeting in April, just to give an update on what we've gotten in for applications and so on. And then there may be a few other things that, that might be of interest. I think we have some public safety information coming up and so on 
So I think the thought was we should probably do the same thing with this group is try to reconvene maybe in that April time frame where we would have some uh, some things to talk about um, and sort of where things are going. Uh, again, we, we we have this sort of focused effort in the fall, and I think we wanted to try to make make it a little bit more uh, throughout the year to give you folks updates on on where things stand. So I think that's pretty much what we have going forward. Okay. Um, obviously, um, again, we'll send out a copy of Chad's presentation to everybody. Uh, I'm assuming, Joe, everybody is invited to attend and listen in on the, um, on the best practice sessions um, as we have them scheduled. Uh, when the data get finalized, we can s share that with members of the subcommittee as well. Yeah, Mary and I are working on mailing lists, et cetera, on who all this, these are going to all go out to and, and so on. Again, we'll be doing all these meetings via HD meeting and, um, you know, we'll try to put together some presentations and other things for those. But yeah, we'll certainly get those out to the GPAC and the subcommittees and the LCMACs and, and, and uh, as many people as we can. We just we want to get as much word out as we can on these. Great, great. Um, obviously, also for this committee, we are still working through the regulatory process for the uh, for the proposed changes to uh, the community mitigation fund, setting aside some of the um, funds for the administrative purposes. Uh, that regulation process is ongoing. Again, we invite everybody to to weigh in with your with your comments. Um, but uh, I believe we should have that wrapped up, uh, that regulatory process wrapped up by the end of the year. Um, any other business? Any members of the committee have anything they'd like to raise with us? All right, before I entertain a motion to adjourn, I will just wish everybody uh, on the committee and our team a uh, happy, healthy, and safe Thanksgiving holiday. And um, if we don't see you for the best practice session in, in December, certainly wish everybody a wonderful holiday season. Thank you all again for your continued commitment to the, to the commission. You've been great stakeholders and advocates for us, and we greatly appreciate that. And, uh, and certainly appreciate everybody's time and commitment. Uh, this work is, uh, the farther we get into casinos being a part of the Massachusetts business landscape, um, the work of this committee continues to be very relevant and continues to grow in its importance. Uh, if there is no other business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn and then we can quickly do a roll call vote and, uh, and actually get everybody out of here a little bit early. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thanks, Jennifer. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Tanya, can you do a quick roll call for us? Yep. Eric Dennis? Yes. Haskell Kennedy Jr.? I just unmuted myself. Yes. Oh. <laughs> All right. Sean Cronin? Yes. Bruce Stebbins? Yes. John Robertson? Ron Hogan? Yes. And Jennifer Bonfiglio? Yes. Great. Right, so that's six. We are adjourned. Thanks, Tanya. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time. Have All a great right. Thanksgiving. Thank you. And a good Everyone holiday. have a great, safe season. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.